questions. What magic pill makes executives smarter and their children dumber? Are men or women easier to bribe? And who's gotten the most out of women's liberation? A teacher, a trader, or a hooker? Such are the questions that swirl through the brains of economist Stephen Levitt and journalist Stephen Dubner. With their first book, Freakonomics, they managed to spin dense, dry data into best-selling cocktail party fodder by using crack dealers, sumo wrestlers, and baby names to explain human nature. These are the guys who look at the numbers and wonder, which is more self-destructive, drunk driving or drunk walking? It turns out on a per mile basis, you're about eight times more likely to die if you go drunk walking home, right? So the, the moral of the story is very obvious. Friends shouldn't let friends walk drunk. But that is mild compared to their really controversial ideas, those harsh realities that come from the law of unintended consequences. I have a theory that the reason crime went down in the 1990s was that we legalized abortion in the 1970s. We didn't make a lot of friends with that particular <laughs> hypothesis. And with super freakonomics, they won't make a lot of friends among women, as they argue that gender equality, the women's liberation movement, hasn't really done that much for female teachers or financiers, but has been great for high-end prostitutes. Prostitution is one of the few, if not the only, sector of the, of the labor force that's dominated by women and always has been. And that arises from the very simple fact that, you know, there's a lot of men who want to have a lot of sex more than they're able to get for free. Today, the law of the land and the law of supply and demand have split the oldest profession into two very different markets. At the bottom, poor, uneducated drug addicts work the streets for around $27 an hour. But at the top, women like Allie do the same job for a much different clientele. When I was at $500 an hour, 10 hours a week was, that was fine. All my bills were paid off. I was, had a lot of free time. After we agreed to mask her identity, Allie described how she chose this job 10 years ago. Not out of desperation, she says, but for adventure. Her husband, suburban home, and good job all seemed boring at the time, so she gave them up to sell her body to strangers. It just became really hard to sit at a computer and program for 40, 50, 60 hours a week for the exact same amount of money, I would get going to the Four Seasons for three hours and having a bottle of champagne and, you know, in the company of a gentleman. In your dating life, this is something you would have done? I would have done anyway. anyway. I already was doing, yeah. Yeah. Probably the same people. <laughs> Levitt and Dubner believe that Allie is an unintended consequence of all those women who marched for equal rights. She uses her liberation to fill a demand, and access to a military education made her a savvy online businesswoman. She works 10 hours a week, she makes $200,000 a year. The question that comes to my mind always is not, why would a woman go and be a high-end prostitute, but just the opposite. Why are there so few women who are out there being high-end prostitutes? We're not saying prostitution is good or bad, but if you want to go out and save women from prostitution, you should understand why they're responding to the market and becoming prostitutes in the first place. If you have a daughter someday and she tells you that she wants to become an escort, what That's would you me. tell her? I would want her to be in charge of her own sexuality, her own, no matter what it is that she decides to do with it. Now, if Allie ever does have a daughter, chances are a private education will provide her best hope for a good life. Because much like prostitution, America's education system has been split into two markets, the haves and the have-nots. At the bottom are mostly public schools, horribly broken since the 70s. Once again, Lovett and Dubner chalk it up to the empowerment of women and the one invention that gave them more control over their professional destiny, the birth control pill. Before the pill, women were not able to make the investments to be doctors and lawyers. Uh, instead, they, they would find career tracks that would allow them to get in and out of, of the labor force. Like teaching. Back in 1940, around half of the college-educated women in this country were teachers. A lot of the best and brightest women stopped becoming school teachers in order to become bankers and lawyers and doctors. As a result, 
the overall talent level of school teachers in this country began to fall quite precipitously. We are not serving our children well. The and chancellor of public schools in Washington, D.C. agrees. When you talk to a lot of educators uh, in this city who have been teaching for 30, 35, 40 years, they'll say, if I graduated from college now, I'd go be a hedge fund manager. For two years, Michelle Ree has battled teachers' unions in an effort to fire bad teachers and raise salaries to hire better ones. But is more money enough to lure smart women back into teaching? Well, Levitt and Dubner point to a study that found men do better at tests when they're given a cash incentive, while women perform about the same. What it seems to suggest is that men respond to money as an incentive the way women respond to other things like having family. They wonder, what if it's not discrimination that explains the glass ceiling? What if it's motivation? And they point to Peak Six, a trading firm in Chicago. They are so desperate to hire more women traders, they just spent $10 million on a website called WeSeed. It's designed to make the stock market more accessible to women. We just couldn't figure out how to get women even interested to do it. Despite the fact that they're just as good, they weren't interested. The best study I've ever seen about men and women and their earnings is done by a collection of Harvard and Chicago economists. And in the end, I think they conclude it doesn't seem to be discrimination really at all. It's the problem is that women just like babies. One of the, again, the unintended consequences is that uh, women go to the, the, the very best uh, MBA programs in the country, and what they end up doing is marrying uh, incredibly sex successful male MBAs uh, and then staying at home and, and, and raising, the, uh, raising the kids. I, I can't wait to see the pushback <laughs> on this particular finding. What's your takeaway, that women should put the apron back on and get where they belong? We live in a world of trade-offs, right? So if a woman decides not to have a family and children, no doubt she can make it further in her career. Does it mean she can't have a career at all if she has a family and children? Well, that's not true either. But I mean, that's the beauty of economics. It's all about trade-offs and, and how people make them and, and what the prices are that go with those choices. Oh, and Allie? She's also making a choice. After 10 years and hundreds of thousands in prostitution earnings, she quit the business back to school. Studying what? Economics, of course. Perfect. 